This is the air I breathe This is the air I breathe Your holy presence Living in me This is the air I breathe This is the air I breathe Your holy presence Living in me And I Am desperate for you This is my daily bread This is my daily bread Your very words Spoken to me This is my daily bread This is my daily bread Your very word Spoken to me And I Am desperate for you Well, good morning and welcome to Trinity United Church of Christ in Brookfield, Wisconsin. We are so glad that you've joined us this morning and you may be sitting back and with a cup of coffee, maybe a cup of orange juice and ready to hear about why God so loves us. And as we've been doing through these Sundays in Lent, we're going to find out another way that we can see again just how much God cares for each and every one of us and all of creation. So please join me now in our call to worship. Our lips sing praise and our whole selves rejoice in the God who makes us free. We gather, recognizing that not all human beings have known this freedom. The divine will was made known in Eden and in Egypt and in Gettysburg and in Cape Town. Born in freedom, redeemed from slavery and judgment, practice of love in all forms and creeds, lives, and peoples, our destiny is in Christ is liberty. Amen. Let us 
us break bread together. Let us break bread together. Let us break bread together. On our knees together. When I fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun, my God have mercy on. Let us drink wine together on our knees. Let us drink wine together on our knees. When I fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun, my God have mercy on me. Let us praise God together on our let us praise God together on our knees. When I fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun, my God have mercy on me. My God have mercy on me. Reading from the psalm for the day, Psalm 19, 7 through 14. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than more pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of transgression, May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And now we join together in our morning prayer. Please join with me. Eternal Lord, your kingdom has broken into our troubled world through the life, death, and resurrection of your Son. Help us to hear your word and obey it so that we may become instruments of your redeeming love through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So at my house, we play, we play a lot of games. In fact, I've been... I guess you might say accused of sometimes, well, having what they would call house rules or I make up my own rules. Nah, that doesn't happen. In fact, they're just sore losers because I, I guess I know how to play games. Speaking of that, let's, let's play a game. And this morning we're talking about, you know, God's guidance. And I guess for a better way to put it is God's rules. You know, what God wants us to do, what we're not supposed to do. But this morning, let, let's, I'm going to play a game with you. And again, I think you're going to find it's fun. So at the count of three, get ready to start the game, okay? So here we go. One, two, three, go! Oh, I see someone over there. You just turned your head. You get five points. Oh, and you, you're walking out of the room. You get minus five points. Oh, and I can see that you're, you're twiddling your fun, thumbs a little bit. And for that, you get 20 points. Oh, and I see somebody in the back over there. And you're just sitting there quiet. You get 30 points. Hey, who's that running around in the back? 
Oh, you get a timeout for two minutes. What? Are you saying I'm making up the rules? You, you don't know the game? Well, that's kind of what I was trying to get at. Sometimes we need rules. You know, we, we in church a lot of times talk about freedom and that we should be able to do our own thing and so forth. And that's all well and good. In fact, that is part of what, what we, we want to learn about is freedom. But today, I'm going to just bring back a little, I guess, a little part of God's rules, and it was called the Ten Commandments. We didn't do it as a reading this morning, but it was part of the, our, you know, what we would normally read on this particular Sunday. But I'm just going to go through them really quick and just kind of remember what they are. So the first one is, have no other gods but God. Number two, do not worship statues or idols. Number three would be careful with God's name. Don't use it in a, in a bad manner. The fourth commandment would be keep the Sabbath day special. In other words, Sunday could be a, a special day, but it's also time for rest and to, to consider God and all the great things that God has done for us. Okay, so rule number five, honor your father and your mother. I would say also respect your elders. Know that they've got some wisdoms that maybe they can pass on to you and respect them. And commandment number six, do not murder. Well, we know what that means. Just don't kill or don't kill the spirit of someone else. Don't bully. How about number seven? Keep your marriage promises. Some would call this, you know, the respect relationships. Don't get in the middle of stuff that you shouldn't have to with other people's relationships, how they are together. Number eight is do not steal. Well, we know that one. And number nine, don't lie. And this could be just a lie or it could be something that you kind of fibbed on or maybe you didn't tell something that you should have told because it would have been important for somebody to know. And the last one is do not covet or covet, covet. I always say covet. And that one's the doozy. In fact, most of the time if I go into a supermarket or I go into, I don't know, Target or you know some store and you see you know really little kids and they're always, I guess, grabbing stuff and they want it and they want it and they cry if they don't get it. Well, that's what that one's all about. Don't want something that you don't have. Be happy with what you have. So just like when I played the game before, we, we need rules in order, in order to be able to play together, to be together. And that's how we know our God, that God loves us. Because God has, has made sure that we understand how we're supposed to be together. So let's play the game. Let's learn the rules, and let's have fun. Let us pray. Dear caring God, we thank you for giving us guidance, giving us the rules, so that we may be careful with each other, so that we may be fair, that we may not have to, I guess, break the rules, in order to be good people. We thank you, God, and we love everything that you've done for us. And we say together, Amen. Christ is with us, he is with us. Break the bread, taste the wine, Christ is with us here. Here is grace, here is peace, Christ is with us, he is with us. Know his grace, find his peace, feast on Jesus In this bread, there is healing. 
In this cup there's life forever In this moment by the Spirit Christ is with us Christ is with us, He is with us, we'll proclaim till He comes, Jesus crucified. Our reading is from John chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. The Passover feast, celebrated each spring by the Jews, was about to take place. Jesus traveled up to Jerusalem. He found the temple teeming with people selling cattle and sheep and doves. The loan sharks were also there in full strength. Jesus put together a whip out of strips of leather and chased them out of the temple stampeding the sheep and cattle, upending the tables of the loan sharks, spilling coins left and right. He t- told the dove merchants, Get your things and out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a shopping mall. That's when the disciples remembered the scripture, Zeal for your house consumes me. But the Jews were upset. They asked, What credentials can you present to justify this? Jesus answered, Tear down this temple, and in three days I'll put it back together. They were indignant. It took 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to rebuild it in three days? But Jesus was talking about his body as the temple. Later, after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered he had said this. They then put two and two together and believed both what was written in the scripture and what Jesus said. Here ends our reading. So I remember growing up, again, playing a lot of games. And, you know, we, one of our things that we would do on a Sunday morning when we lived in Fiendsville and then we eventually moved to uh, Chicago when I was a little kid. And our tradition was on a lot of Sunday mornings, we'd go to church. And then on the way back, we would drive past uh, one of the stores was called Treasure Island. And it was kind of like a Target store. or At that time, it was kind of a variety store. And each Sunday, one of us, one of either my two sisters or my brother or myself, my dad would let us kind of run down the game aisle and pick a game. And he'd kind of watch to make sure what kind of game we were pulling out. But the fun was to learn something new, you know, bring it home, put the game on the table and play it a few times as a family. So if you think of those special memories of how you learn games and how you learn the rules, in fact, one of the games I remember as a, a preteen that I w- always wanted to play, and I would sit at the table as I would see my, I guess, elders, my father, my mother, my uncles, even my grandparents. They would sit down, and you'd see all this, all these coins on the table and, and cards. They were playing sheep's head. Now, again, I know some of you might know this game. Um, 
again, I come from the Sheboygan area, but I know this game is, uh, it's kind of got its roots in European. Some people play Euchre, some, you know, there's other versions that are similar to it. But Sheep's Head was always one of those games that you, as you were watching it, just looked so, like so much fun. But the rule was, you kind of had to be at least a teenager, and here I'm like 11, but I sat and watched it and learned the rules, and eventually I got to sit at the table. Well, even when you learn the rules, sometimes the nuances of the rules are what gets you, I guess, either that you collect the money after each hand or that you lose the hand. One of the strategies in Sheep's Head is knowing what your cards are and sometimes you have a partner on the table and you need to lead your partner without obviously table talking, which again is a, a rule you don't want to break. But the fun of games is that there's this, if you think about it, a framework within the game that says you need to be knowing the rules so that everybody has the same chance of winning. Well, this morning I talked in the youth message about the Ten Commandments a little bit and how, you know, God loves us and we see this, this guidance coming from God. And if you think about it, it, it's got its roots all the way back into when creation started. You get the story of Adam and Eve in the garden. And the rules that were set, very simple rules. In other words, the, the most simple rule was you can do anything you want, just don't eat of that tree. That was it. One rule. <laughs> and we broke it. We broke it. One rule. So as we go along, we start getting the stories in the Hebrew Bible of how we as humans keep pushing the limits of breaking the rules and God, in some ways very subtle and in some ways very dramatically, like in the story of Noah, where God gives us corrections. It makes me think of and remember some of the teachers that I had, like in school. We all know we had that one teacher that we loved. In other words, the teacher that, you know, seemed to always have a smile on his or her face and would lead the class in laughter and just, it just seemed like it was so much fun. And then you had those teachers. In fact, I remember one that I had in high school that uh, was notorious. In other words, people would say as a, as you came in as a freshman into high school, they'd say, Oh, you don't want Mrs. So and so because She's really tough. Man, she's got so many rules about how she wants things done. And again, it was speech class. Imagine me in speech class. But she was tough, tough as nails, and didn't back down on what she was expecting of each one of us. And, and here's the, the unreal thing about all of that and the irony of it is that at this point in my life, I can look back and I can, I can really say that she was one of the best teachers I ever had. Well, why? Part of it was because she had a balance of, of that teaching, but at the same time making sure that we understood what the rules of the road were in her classroom and expecting us to follow it, and making sure that we did the best that we could with what we were given in that class. It sounds very much like our God. The story we get this morning from John about the tearing down of the temple. You know, I'm just I'm going to make a little bit of a story of it because I want you to understand why this one fits into what we're talking about with guidance this morning. So again, this is this is a time that the temple is just beaming with people. People are coming in, it's the it's the Passover, it's their big celebration. And one of the things when they made the trek to this temple, and you've probably heard this before, but one of the big things that you did was you brought a sacrifice to the temple. And it had to be 
the right sacrifice, an unblemished lamb, a, a, a beautiful bird, certain kind of bird. And the priests at the time would make sure that this was the best of the best. Well, part of getting to the best of the best was you needed to have either, I guess, money or something to trade in order to get the best that you possibly could for that sacrifice so that your time after that you would be blessed by God because your, your sacrifice was so grand. Well, over the years, what ended up happening with the temple was the rules kept ratcheting up. In other words, you got to have a better sacrifice, even better. Guess what? It costs more. You need to start trading. And one of the things they did also was you had to pay in temple money. You couldn't just grab some, I guess, cash out of your pocket and pay for that lamb or pay for those doves or whatever it was that you were going to purchase. You had to exchange your, I guess, currency into whatever the temple currency was. Think what could go wrong there? Somebody decides that their currency is worth a little bit more than yours and starts eh, maybe profiting a little bit more than what they should and taking advantage of the fact that you can't buy that lamb unless you've got the right currency. So guess what? You're going to have to pay the piper. Well, when Jesus comes upon this and he's looking at the celebration Right away, he's going, what have you done with what this was supposed to be? You've, you've not only broken the rules, but you've made your own rules. God never said that you had to use temple coins. Who said that? We did. And we keep trying to think that if we change the rules, that we're okay because, well, it's still the end game is that we're getting to the, in that respect to the sacrifice. We're going to make God happy, but uh, along the way, I'm going to make a little profit. I'm going to make sure, you know, I push somebody down and I make sure that I, I make them suffer a little bit, but you know, I'm, I'm okay. That's what Jesus was so upset about. He was like saying, you've taken this, this, if you want to call it this sacrifice to God, and you've made it a temple of thieves. You've lost your way. God told you what he wanted. You know, when Jesus was questioned about what is the most important commandment, he, he said, oh, wait a second. You're, you're, getting, you're, you're getting yourselves into too much. Let's sum it down into those, those, these two sentences. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And then love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. I mean, if you talk about a game that has only got two rules in it, how can we get that so wrong? It's part of the reason why we struggle today. When we look around at the world and we start saying, why, why are things so crazy? Why is it that we're at war? Why is it that we're in conflict? Why do politics hurt so much? Why are we hurting each other? Why are we judging? Why is there such a disparity in income when really we've all got the same rule? What happened? It's not to say that we shouldn't be building up the blessings that God has given us and then using them. It's not to say that we should be judging those that have more than us and saying that they don't deserve it. It's really about knowing that we still have the same two rules, no matter what station in life we are. And if we really do them in the manner that we were taught to do them, that a lot of these other things don't even come into play. I remember going camping. And we would go camping and as you know, kids, you find other kids. 
In other words, you're kind of bored because the parents are sitting around talking, you know, whatever, and you start finding other kids that are in the campground. And all of a sudden, somebody goes, let's play a game. And they just start playing. And somebody will say what the rules are, and hopefully they're consistent, eh, not like mine were before. But then the beauty of what happens is once the rules are set, once everybody understands what the rules are in games like Kick the Can or Ghost in the Graveyard or whatever those were, hopscotch, they just start playing. The kids aren't looking at each other saying, well, what do you do for a living? You know, I don't, I don't know if you can play with us or what, what town did you come from? And I would dare say that we as children didn't even look at the color of the other person's skin. Whether they were, I don't know, male or female, just as long as they wanted to play the game. And I can remember too as a kid, like somebody would get hurt. They'd fall down, they'd they'd trip over a rock or something, and we'd stop the game and we'd all go over there and make sure that that person was okay. My goodness. We knew the game better as kids sometimes, didn't we? So this theme of God so loves us, that God gives us guidance, has always given us guidance. And Jesus comes to the world and says it over and over again and simplifies it because we've just gotten in the way of ourselves. And says, you could have a, you could have a thousand laws, but they're still going to come down to the same two things at the end of the day, at the end of the judgment, at the end of the sentence. So let's, let's play. Let's be God's children. Let's, let's look at the things that we have and share them and be there for each other and serve each other and know that that's part of us knowing the rules of the game. Love your God and love your neighbor. That's what God wanted us to know. That's what God keeps whispering the stories and the life and the living and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the giving of us of the Holy Spirit to keep us playing together. God, we thank you for these rules. Let us pray. Dear God, you've given us so many examples of how we're to be to each other. You've given us examples of how we're supposed to be with you. Give Give us patience. Let us slow down and remember the rules of the game, this game of love that you've given us. Be patient with us because we'll keep, we'll keep changing the rules to make it work that we have some advantage. But then silently and reverently remind us that we are your children and that you want us to be as good and as gracious and forgiving and patient with each other as you are with us. We praise your name. Amen. In our joys and concerns this morning, we lift up the family and friends of Roland Pershon, who passed away this last week and went from life to life. We pray for him, his family, and friends, that they may know the glory of the gift of love 
that was so shared in our knowing of Roland. We also pray this morning for, again, the continued escalation and speed with which the vaccine is being presented to all of our senior citizens, our folks that are in nursing homes, hospitals, and we're on the cusp of those who teach our children and those who are on the front lines of caring for others. We also ask that you pray for those around the world who are seeing divisions, or they're seeing conflict or war. They didn't know that that is not what you wanted and that we have much work to do. We want you to be with our governments, all the world governments, that they may find your voice, your voice to guide them in their actions, and that they may know your rule, your rules, of how we as people within your creation are to be. And we thank you for the change in the weather that brings hope once again that a spring is right around the corner and that winter wasn't so bad. You were there for us you'll be there before us. So as we join together in saying the prayer that your son, Jesus Christ, taught us to pray, let us remember that this, this prayer becomes our ask of you for what we need for this time, for this day, and how we can honor you by being thankful for all that we receive. Please join with me in the saying of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So we come together this morning to share a simple meal. A simple meal that calls us to be one community, one with our Lord Jesus who is celebrating with his friends. And we do the same this morning. This table is open to all. And by that, it means that there is no one that should not have a place if they choose at this table. All we ask is that you know where this is leading to, which is knowing Jesus Christ as the Son of the living God. So on that night, Jesus sat down with his disciples, his friends. And this night, he knows what would be happening. He would be betrayed. He would be ignored, denied. But even so, he knew what love was supposed to do, and he had told them many times. So within this meal, he took something very strong but basic to each one of our lives and gave it back. So Jesus took the bread and he blessed it, saying, God, thank you for the bread, this bread that sustains us, 
that carries us in our lives to the work of your world. This, he said to the others, is my body, and it will be broken and shared with you. And he broke it. And he gave it to his friends, saying, this is my body broken for you. And every time that you eat of this bread, do so in remembrance of me. Take and eat. And after he was done sharing the bread, he then took the cup, blessing it, saying, Thank you, God, for the fruit of the vine that has seen the sun and the wind and the rain and the good earth and produce fruit that we now share together. And pouring it out, he said this, this is my blood. And he shared it with all of his disciples and his friends, saying that with this blood, there's a new covenant between you and I and God, saying that as we partake in this, the love will flow through our bodies into the world. This blood, my blood, is shared for you. For the forgiveness of those things you do in non-love and sustain, sustaining you in the work of love. Take and drink. These, the good things of the earth, now given to us back again to sustain us in the work of love, in the work that Jesus Christ taught us to do, and now becomes part of us to share with the world. May we be blessed with knowing that our God loved us so much that God wanted to be with us and for us. Amen. Good morning. I'm Terry Allen, President of the Council, and I'm giving the announcements for this Sunday, March 7th, the second Sunday in Lent. First, let me send all of our prayers to the Roland Pershon family in the death of our long-term faithful member, Roland. Per Roland's wishes, Pastor Jan at St. John's UCC in Germantown is working with the family on the final service. That info has or will be imparted through an obituary in the newspaper. We will all miss Roland's wit, wisdom, and deep faith. He truly was a Renaissance man. This is a reminder that there will be a meet and greet by reservation only today at 1130 in our sanctuary. There will be two more opportunities to sign up for these meetings uh, for Sunday, March 14th and Sunday, March 21st. Remember to call the office to register. Also, the homebound visits have begun with Pastor Dan and a Trinity member visiting various members who cannot come to the meet and greets. They are going very well with conversation and communion, and I understand some jokes. Uh, if anyone needs a home visit, please call the office to make that request. These additional visits may take place after Easter in late April and into May if necessary. Remember the Wednesday Lenten virtual services at 7 p.m. Lastly, Council's monthly meeting will take place on Monday, March 8th, tomorrow at 5.45 in the Dining Hall. If anyone wants to attend Open Forum, 
please contact me prior to that meeting. Thank you, and please stay safe. It is our nature as God's children to learn what it means to be givers. And in order for us to be givers, there needs to be also receivers. I know in my life, I've received many things. But in some respects, I sometimes find it easier to be a giver and not allow myself to be the receiver of the care and the love of others. So this morning, as we talk about the sharing of our gifts, may we know that we have that ability to be givers. And we know how it feels when we, re we have received from others things that maybe we needed but didn't have the voice or were too embarrassed to ask for. We are humbled by this. We are humbled by how we are gifted by our God every day, every moment. So this morning as we share our time and talent and treasures, know that these things that go into your church here at Trinity United Church of Christ become the mission of us giving back to the world. And at the same time, we know there are things that we need. Let us be open to both. Please join with me in our dedication. Without talking back and without asking questions, let us move into God's love. Let us go in between with God to offer our gifts. And let us give God our thanks and our tithes and offerings. Our dedication. In between God, bless these gifts with your love so that we might share them quite openly with all who need your change. Amen.
So we shared the gift of communion. We shared the gift of the love and life that Jesus Christ laid before us on a table. We were given the rules and we were given everything and every piece that we needed to be in the game of love. So as we go out this morning and we go out into the, the sunshine, let us remember that there are certain people that still need to have us in their lives and that we need to keep our eyes open and that we need to be fair, not judging, but rather inviting. Inviting people to know that God is with us, that God has given us everything, and that we are not wanting. And for those out there that need our help, that we are ready and willing, and we are ready to be God's hands of love and work in the world. Go in peace. May God shine upon you. May God's love carry you. And may you walk with Jesus into the world. Amen.
filled with wonder, awestruck wonder at the mention of your name. 